And see, put that this way. So we're going to be going through the Voyagers. Here we go, I think. There we go. Now we got it. All right, Sunny, Shannon, Danielle. So, so, so excited to have you here. Definitely please type in the chat. I finally got it figured out. You guys are amazing. Thank you for being so patient with me as I get this going. You'll see me kind of look a couple different ways. I am going to share the screen today so that you guys can read along with the Voyager's book as we go along, just so that you have that opportunity. But definitely so honored to connect with the Soul Circle to have a way for us to really amplify our energy at this time. Yeah, just I love you guys so much and being able to share these live experiences means the world to me. So I've been really excited and looking forward to this. So welcome everybody. Hi Robin, so happy to have you here. So much love to each and every one of you. So we're going to be diving into the Voyager's book. This is Voyager's 2, The Secrets of Amenti. This is a book by Ashiana Dean. This is a book that is a translation from the CDT plates. This is our heritage. This, is, this, is, this wisdom is the Blu-ray wisdom. This is our memories that we get to dive into. This transmission came through all the way in 1998. So we're getting to revisit it now at a time where I think a lot more of humanity and a lot more of the consciousness on the planet is able to ingest a lot of this. There is a lot of information within this book that is kind of now more history, <laughs> even when we look at it. Hello, Gloria. So happy to have you here, Darlene. I love you, sweetheart. Big hugs. So as we get to read this, one of the key things that we get to do is dive into a connection to our higher self, that this is really our greatest wisdom, is about creating this channel of connecting to our higher self, allowing all transmissions, all wisdom, all energy that we receive, whether it's a podcast we're listening to, whether it's this live, going through the Voyager's book, whatever material that you're ingesting, that it's really vital and important for us to be filtering it through our higher self so that anything and everything that is not of our highest vibration has the ability to be filtered out so that we can easily sift and read through all the records on the earth, but really be able to clear out anything that has distortions, metatronic distortions, any kind of reversal distortions in it. One of the things, if you've been listening to me for a little bit, you'll hear me say quite a bit that there's not really anything on the planet that doesn't have some sort of distortion tagged into it. Because a lot of the negative alien agendas, a lot of the off-planetary races that have been keeping us in amnesia are pretty smart. They knew how to kind of filter in and get in there and kind of shift and change all the teachings just enough to keep us on this little rat race, doing circles, spirals, not really getting anywhere. So one of the key ways out of this, what we're learning is how to break free from our reincarnation cycles, how to break free from any of the manipulation traps or the metatronic cubes. And part of doing this is connecting fully and completely to our higher self. And as we connect to our higher self, our higher self transcends all the dimensional layers of this dimension, or, or sorry, of the deceptions. And then our higher self helps us begin to easily identify truth, not truth, truth, not truth, truth, not truth. So I really want to start out with that as we get started on this series. I'm not going to say this every time when we go into a chapter because there is just so much, right? But one of the things I'm going to invite you to do is that as we listen to this, allow your higher self. So we want to just say in this moment, we dedicate this reading to the higher selves of all individuals that are listening, that anything and everything that is not within the highest vibration of the higher self, that it be seamlessly, easily filtered out, that that which is meant to be received, ingested, brought within the wisdom of the heart will easily anchor in, in alignment with the higher self. We set this intention now, and so it is. 
So as we get started, I want to actually talk about a few key notes in the first chapter. We are going to be looking at a lot of energy around the Syrians. The keepers of the CDT plates were in the Sirius B star system. So we're going to connect. So those of you that have a connection to the Sirius star system, to the Syrian temples, to a lot of the Atlantean and Lemurian times, you know, definitely this is going to be something that you might have a huge trigger of remembrance in. We're going to be looking at a lot of the energy around the first seedings. So we're going back quite far. We're going back about 560 million years ago. And as we look at this, we're going to be talking about beings that are referred to as metaterrestrials. So I want to just dive into what is a metaterrestrial, because some of these terms are going to be a bit vast. Metaterrestrial, meta basically refers back to self, but also means beyond. So it is our self or the races that are beyond this creation or beyond this 15 dimensional time matrix or universal system. So as we get to look at this, we're going to look at a lot of the metaterrestrials or the beings from beyond this 15 dimensional time matrix that were part of the seeds or the creator races that were helping to build this template. One of the things I do want to start to share with each and every one of you is there are 24 original God seeds that helped to seed this 15 dimensional time matrix. Only about three of those seeds still has the original God seed codes back to our God source template, to the God seed. Unfortunately, that means about 21, 21 to 22 of the seeds that originally seeded this creation have become distorted within the creation. Now, I don't say that to bring any energy that, that feels dense or heavy, but just as an awareness that a lot of what we're doing is beginning to help rehabilitate all of the 24 faces, if you will, all the 24 seeds. And one of the primary seeds that is doing this is called the Melchizedek Cloister Order or the Melchizedek God Seed Code. So this is the major transmission that comes through these CDT plates, the Blue Ray lineage. And the wisdom that comes through these CDT plates is coming primarily from the family of the God seed of the Melchizedek Code. So the Melchizedek Code has been offering themselves as a rehabilitation God seed for all 23 other God seeds. So it doesn't matter what maybe you align to more or if your soul over soul or universal tree of life comes from one of these other 23 seeds. One of the amazing things to recognize is that we are all family. They are all united. They are all in the metaterrestrial realms, basically unified within even another time matrix. But that within this, the Melchizedek God seed is one of the primary seeds that is assisting us to return all of our God spark back on alignment so that we can have full ascension again. So one of these next things I wanted to touch in is we're going to be actually getting to see a little bit of our connection to the Pleiadian star system. Many of you have deep connections to the Pleiades, to the priestess lineages, to Atlantis, to Lemuria. This is where the original Atlantis and Lemuria originated. And within there, we're going to see how a lot of the digression started from there. And within there, we're also going to be referring to a star race or a star nation referred to as the Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. It also says C-E-R-E-Z at different times as it hybridizes later. And this I really want to amplify for you guys that when you hear this, that you're going to recognize this as that time when we had that gift of the feather. This is an avian race line. This is one of the race lines from one of the God seeds that offered the higher genetics back into uh, the angelic human race line in order to help us continuously evolve. One of the reasons why I really want to highlight this is because this is going to help us understand a lot better 
what it means to be a hybrid, what it means to be an indigo, what it means to be on this rescue mission so that we can understand that part of what we're doing is coming in to infuse new rehabilitated genetics back into the into humanity's gene pool in order to help consciousness begin to elevate again so primarily i feel that anybody really resonating with these books this work the cdd plates uh this melchizedek blu-ray lineage or order this is where you are going to recognize that you're part of this hybrid race line that is here to be uplifting the genetics of humanity. So in a way, very similar to that gift of the feather from the Ceres. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I can already answer the question. This does feel intimate enough for me. I feel so connected to you all. Oh, love you. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'm super excited to be uh, just connected with the soul circle. I love you guys so much. Part of our soul circle energy has really talked a lot about the motherland of Mu. So we're going to start to see some of the energy of Mu from the Kelantic perspective or from the CDT plate wisdoms and perspective. The motherland of Mu we recognize as some of the original templates that are held by the divine guardian mothers. This is going to be connected even to the cosmic dragon mothers. This is going to be connected to the Nagas. This is going to be connected to a lot of our star families, but we're going to see that it again also originated off planetary or when earth was at a higher vibrational frequency so this is something that i'm going to invite you to also start to get to see that when we talk about the lumian races um understanding the four coming cataclysms that were coming we're also recognizing some of the original motherland of mu energy so that we can recognize kind of timeline of it. Sometimes we try to look at earth history, but it's difficult for us to understand that earth's history isn't all linear in the third dimension. It's quite quantum through multiple harmonic universes and through multiple kind of <laughs> tesseracts of time, if you will. So that's a beautiful thing to understand with that. So we're also going to be looking kind of at the creation of certain race lines and then how the seed race line started to get created. And in this first chapter, we'll really get to see the energy of the Paladorian, the, uh, the Paladorian covenant and the Paladorian races. And part of this energy that I want to share with you about the Polydorian races is uh, there is a video that I did uh, back probably about a year ago or so on the our Polydorian races. And so I'm going to link that later on into the description below so that you guys can revisit that again if you want to have a little bit of an understanding of that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go ahead and just share this with you. So within this, again, this is, again, the Voyagers 2 by Ashiana Dean. And this is the Secrets of Amenti, Amenti Transmission 1998. Throughout Voyagers, the sleeping abductees Various speakers of the Guardian Alliance have provided you with information pertinent to your times and to the success of your species evolution. We have provided glimpses of your future, your distant past, and what is taking place behind the scenes of your multidimensional present. All of this data is relevant to various peoples of your times, but there is information not yet addressed that is perhaps the most significant of all or it will provide you with the missing links of knowledge through which your past, present, and future can be united. We of the Guardian Alliance have an announcement to make. It is a message your species has waited over 800,000 years to hear. Our announcement will, make, will be made in later chapters of this book, for without the information contained here with them, this announcement would have little meaning for you. In order for you to understand the importance of this message, we must first provide you with the sequential summary of the true history of your evolutionary journey. With these missing pages of time lives the purpose and process of your evolution as a people. 
In previous chapters, we have explored the beginnings of your species lineage, beginning with the inception of your race as the Terranusiums upon planet Tara in the second harmonic universe, 560 million years ago. This is where your earth drama began and the place to which you will eventually be led through the course of your evolutionary progression. To explore your entire history from 560 million years ago to the present would require many, many books. Here we will simply provide you with the data most important to your understanding of the purposes of your present evolution. Starting now with the origins and the fall. Starting 560 million years ago to 550,000 million years ago. This is the origins of the first world in Tara in the second harmonic universe. Approximately 560 million years ago upon the planet Tara within the second harmonic universe, your earth is presently in the first harmonic universe. Many ET and metaterrestrial races combine their genetic and energetic makeup to create a master race of beings that would serve as guardians of the planet Tara. The Syrian Council from Harmonic Universe 2, along with several other groups, were appointed as directors and overseers of the project, the Terranusium T1 experiment. Metaterrestrials from the fourth and fifth Harmonic Universes were the founders of this project working through a seed race called the Lyrans from the third harmonic universe. The Lyrans created a race of beings in harmonic universe three called the Elohim, who would become the overseers for the Syrian races in harmonic universe two. The Elohim became one of the numerous supervisory groups within the Terranusium experiment due to the Syrian race contribution of genetic identity to the experiment. The Turanusium race evolved for about 8 million years on Tara with 12 sub or 12 primary sub-racial divisions among them. Each of the 12 Turanusium sub-races carried a genetic slant derived from the 12 primary contributions to the T1 experiment, but all of them carried the unique 12 strand DNA package that T1 were designed to embody. The 12 Terranusium subraces were the Brahman, the Dharamin, the Atanai, the Triaten, the Azlertan, the Keltos, the da Adami, the Uratans, or Urans, the Luri, the Sarazes, the Neztak, the, the Nezaktai, and the Melchizedek. After evolving successfully for many years, the Terranusium race began to digress. Their genetic code began to break down and their cultures falling into disharmony. Manipulation by interbreeding with various unrelated ET strands was the primary cause of this digression. Just to kind of take a note on that. I'm going to read that one more time. After evolving successfully for many years, the Terranusium race began to digress their genetic code breaking down and their cultures falling into disharmony, manipulation by and interbreeding with various unrelated ET strains was the primary cause of this digression. About 8 million years into their evolution, 552 million years ago, the Terranusium race divided into two primary racial strains. This was the Alanians, sometimes referred to as the Belial Kudium and the Lumians, frequently referred to or called the Adami Kudman. The two strains of Terranusium evolved together on, the lar on one large land mass called Eden, creating two cultures known as Alania and Lumia. Both cultures evolved on Terra for about one million years. Both races carried the original 12-strand DNA genetic code of their Terranusium lineage, and both carried mutations and digressions of that code from the interstellar breeding. Cultural disturbances escalated along with the continued digression of the Alanian and Lumian strains, and hostility arose as the Alanians sought dominion over the more passive Lumian culture. 
I want to take one pause there really quick just to check the chat. Good morning. Good morning, Stephanie. So happy to have you here. This is really important to understand. Again, recognizing that the Lumian, or what we might even refer to as a future Lumerian, was the more docile, whereas the Atlantean began to work more scientifically, scientifically. And one of the primary energies with this, I want to just give a little galactic history for you guys, is that imagine that within this very unique seeded race lines, these 12 tribes, if you will, that were evolving on Tara. So the second harmonic universe of Earth in the Pleiades system was cruising along, doing really, really well. They were evolving. They were becoming the genetic codes that were going to assist a, a lot of the energy, be able to be the bodies that could house the codes of the 12 strand DNA. So the universal template. But within there, we're going to recognize that there was infiltration at this time. A lot of this infiltration we're going to see is coming from either races that had entered into the system or just other planetary races that began to interbreed their genetics with these races and then began to disrupt the experiment or the project of this race line. Good morning, Stellar, Shrin Shrin Stellar Shriner. <laughs> Beautiful. So happy to have you here. So I wanted to take that key point so that you can start to understand intergalactic travel, that this wasn't an isolated event. Remember that we have the Lyrans in the Lyran system, but at a different harmonic universe, we have Syrians in the Syrian system. So there is multidimensional travel that is happening through different councils and cultures being appointed, but also interstellar travel that there are interdimensional beings and off planetary beings from the Tara system that saw what was going on there and they took advantage really in a huge way and began to either infiltrate through mind, through thoughts. This is no different than your memories of the deception that happened in Atlantis and, and leading into the original falls of Atlantis. So I want to just tie that in for you guys so that you can get a little bit more of a picture that this is happening on a many constellations, many star systems throughout our universal star system. So Mu, the Lumians, Ceres, and the priesthood of Mu. So now we are looking at about 550, 750,000 million years ago. And this is going to be a 50,000 year span that we're going to be looking at. Mu, the Lumians, Ceres, and the priesthood of Mu. So keeping a close eye on their Alanian antagonists, about 550, 750,000 million years ago, certain members of the Lumian race foresaw a cataclysm in their future, brought on by the increasingly dangerous Alanian experimentation with power generated through Tara's planetary core. The Lumians petitioned assistance from Harmonic Universe to the Syrian Council and the Harmonic Universe 3 Elohim. They petitioned for help, and under the direction of the Syrian Council, the Lumians set up amongst their members an organization called the Council of Mu. Through the Council of Mu, the Lumians moved larger numbers of their race across the oceans to a small continent, Antara, that was primarily uninhabited by organized culture. They named this continent Mu. And for, for 50,000 years, the Lumians of Mu worked with the Syrian Council to redirect the genetic digression of their race. During this period, the Elohim of Harmonic Universe 3 interbred with the Lumians who carried the Ceres Terranusium subrace strain, strain in their gene codes, creating a race called the Ceres or the Ceres, which purified the genetic strain of the Lumians of Tara, the gift of the feather. Descendants of the Ceres became later known as the Ceres with an S, who interacted with Harmonic Universe 1, eat Earth humans at various periods. The Lumians and the Ceres 
coexisted peacefully on Mu, attending to their intergalactic and spiritual business of the Council of Mu. The Ceres created the priesthood of Mu, an egalitarian spiritual collective with a strong matriarchal slant, whose practices centered around the teachings of the sacred law of one or unity consciousness. The Mu priesthood exists to this day and its primary motivating force with certain Terran communities. The community of Mu continued its evolution through the realigned 12-strand DNA genetic code until about 550 million years ago. Elenia, Templar Solar Initiates, and the Syrian Rebellion. Throughout the evolution of Mu, digression continued within the Atlantean race, and anti-Lumian sentiment ran high within the power-hungry Atlantean elite. The Atlanteans employed subterranean grid technologies in hopes of bringing the now bountiful continent of Mu under Atlantean domain. The Lumians and the Ceres foresaw the cataclysm of Tara that would result from these technologies about 900 years prior to the events. The Ceres tried to warn the Atlanteans, but to no avail. Petitions to the Syrian council to redirect the Atlanteans had failed, giving rise to the Atlantean rebellion and Lumian Syrian resistance. The Atlanteans were controlled by an elite group called the Templar Solar Initiates, who had been entrusted with rulership and guardianship over the Atlantean continent by the Syrian council. The Templar Solar Initiates became sympathetic with the Syrian root race Anunnaki in their Syrian rebellion against the Syrian Council and refused to allow dictates of the Syrian Council and advisory Elohim, who based their decisions on the teachings of the Sacred Law of One. Through the Templar Solar Initiates, the power struggle between the Syrian Anunnaki and the Elohim Syrian Council, the loyal Syrian Blues, and other Syrian root race was brought to Tara. This period in Atlantean history is also known as the Syrian Rebellion, and through this power struggle, the planet Tara was almost destroyed. Now, I know those of you who are listening are probably have a lot of histories within you that you remember this. Welcome, Shelly. So happy to have you here. Happy to see you, Goddess Essence. Oh, beautiful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. One of the things we want to understand, a lot of the invasion energies that we want to recognize are coming from these Anunnaki forces. So the Anunnaki's, again, were created outside the sacred container of the sacred womb of the mother. They were a genetic race line that was missing some of their key genetics and codes. And so when they saw the sacred lineages of these 12 tribes, they wanted to infiltrate and take them over. They were able to really infiltrate into the Atlantean, or what we will think of as the Atlantean, lineage or root race lines so within this there we can already start to see the manipulation of turning even though all 12 tribes truly are family brothers and sisters right same genetics just kind of uh quantified and within this it was amazing how their mind really came in to really turn the Atlanteans against the Lumians and start to create that massive pain within there of separation and attacking our own family through these uh, manipulation tactics. So as we get to understand this, we're starting to see that full-blown war and distrust is already happening, again, within the Syrian rebellion. This is a massive power struggle that as they, as the Alanian side really kept fighting for the power, what we're recognizing is for those of you that hold Syrian genetics and Syrian DNA, we're recognizing that uh, Sirius A, Sirius B, Sirius C, we have a recognition that all the energies there are a little bit different as far as the different races. And the Sirius A system primarily was one of the root places where the Anunnaki settled in. And so there is a massive uh, group from Sirius that is a hybridized Anunnaki race line. We'll get into this much deeper later in this book. But to recognize that even within the Syrian energy, 
there is this feeling of being ripped apart, being pushed against each other or to fight against each other because of the digressive infiltration of the interbreeding that was taking place. So now let's dive in a little bit further. We're going to look at about a 750,000 year period of time, really going into who are these Templar solar initiates. I want you guys to recognize the Templar soul the sorry, the Templar solar initiates are really these beings that would have been seen as like this priesthood, like this council in charge, and they really became uh, quite the problem, quite digressive to what started to cause a lot of the problems. So here we go, Ur, Terranites, Mu, and the priesthood of Ur. Certain groups of Alanians became aware that the Templar solar initiates were misusing power in the way that would result in the implosion of Terra's planetary grid. This group of Alanians approached the Lumians and Ceres of Mu, asking for assistance, and many of them defecting into the territories of Mu. The Ceres interbred with these Alanians, primarily those carrying the Eutarian Terranusium sub-race genetics line, realigning their digressing genetic code, and the Alanians further interbred with the Lumians. The original Terranusium 12 DNA gene code was rebuilt and purified through the Ceres lumian alanian blend. This revitalized Terranusium race became known as the ur Terranites. The Ur Terranites created the temple and priesthood of Ur upon the continent of Mu. The priesthood of Ur shared most practices of the priests of Mu, but developed interest in more scientific applications of the spiritual law, such as portal mechanics. Like the priesthood of Mu, the priests of Ur exist on Terra to this day, and they serve as guardians and gatekeepers of the time portal structures that link Earth to present-day Tara. During the Syrian rebellion on Tara, the priesthood of Ur stood against the Templar solar initiates of Alania, eventually retreating underground with the people of Mu, unable to stop the Templars from misusing the power of the planetary core. Small wars within the local galactic sectors were fought during these times, which became known as the Terran Wars. Under direction of the Syrian Council and Elohim, the priests of Ur began to prepare for the pending grid implosion. Many people were evacuated to other sympathetic star systems where they evolved safely, intermingling with other races. So I want to actually... Um, highlight that one last thing because there is a lot of you that genetically have these memories in your codes but also this is part of how we're connected to other star races and then also how many star seeds are coming to earth right now to be of assistance but even though there's a connection to these other star systems there's a lot of relocation that has happened throughout our many different 950 billion years of our universe, our universal template, 15 dimensional universal template. So this is where we want to kind of understand that there is a lot of connections that we'll have to multiple star systems. And sometimes at the core, we will have a resonance to this mission, but also recognize that we're bringing in wisdom from multiple other star races and star systems as we do this. So again, the last line in there is super important. Many people were evacuated to other sympathetic star systems where they evolve safely, intermingling with other races. So becoming further hybridized with other races and still holding the genetics of these memories for this Terranusium or this Earth Experiment Project. So diving in a little bit more. Cataclysm of Tara. Ooh, this one's a charge. <laughs> Approximately 550 million years ago, the power generator crystals deeper underground in Alania exploded due to the Templar solar initiates misuse of power from Tara's planetary core. This created a chain reaction of implosions within Tara's planetary grid. Portions of Tara's grid were blown apart and fragmented, becoming detached from the morphogenetic field of the planet. 
Portions of Alania were immediately destroyed and the entire planet suffered the effects of rapid pull reversal. For a period of two days, Tara ceased to rotate on its axis and it took 10,000 years to restabilize Tara's environment during which time the few surviving Taran races still on planet retreated permanently underground, so into the inner earth. Descendants of these civilizations who survived this disaster still flourish within elaborate underground communities. Surface life also returned to Tara following this 10,000 year period of healing because portions of the planet's energy structures had been ripped from the main planetary grid Planet Tara could not continue its evolution of dimensional ascension into the third harmonic universe. Tara could not reemerge with the energy grid of its Dimension 7 counterpart Gaia until its own grid system was repaired. Tara became trapped in the tracks of time within the second harmonic universe. So we're going to start to get into what these fragmented parts became, which is us in this third harmonic, uh, or sorry, in this third dimensional reality where we are. The inner earth races, many of the inner earth races here on earth right now, our inner earth families are actually from this second harmonic Tara planet or timeline. And they retreated inwards and still interdimensionally exist within our planet. So for those of you that really resonate with a lot of the inner earth families and beings, um, especially uh, when you dive into their wisdom and how are they still so advanced because they're still operating in the second harmonic universe dimensional fields. And this is how they're anchoring in our resonant frequencies here on earth. But it's important to understand that it's not like these chunks could get left behind and we didn't have to do anything with it. Because these fragmented parts got basically stuck, frozen in time in the first harmonic universe, it halted the progression of the Pleiades and Tara. So therefore that harmonic universe couldn't connect to the third harmonic universe. It destroyed the entire body of the cosmic mother. So it began to, it, what would happen is if we weren't here creating this rescue mission plan, all of it, all the dimensions up would eventually begin to fall. That's how important this whole first dimension uh, universe is for all of us. So as we get to dive into this, let's look at the fall to harmonic universe one and our 12 planets. So now we're getting into our solar system. How did the solar system really get created? So 550 million years ago, the fragments of the Taran planetary grid that became dismembered from Tara's core energy supply rapidly fell in vibration until they could no longer resist the natural magnetic pull of the descending interdimensional energy currents. The planet fragments were pulled into a sun within Tara's universe and vaporized and the morphogenetic field carried in those fragments was pulled in a black hole at the center of the sun and reemerged into a galaxy within the lower dimensional fields of harmonic universe one. Entering the system as a gaseous substance, this morphogenetic field broke down into 12 pieces, which set up a mini solar system around a star within an already existing harmonic universe one solar system. One of the 12 pieces of Tara's fragmented morphogenetic field fused with the sun, while the other 11 pieces began to build up matter density and re-manifest their forms through their portion of the morphogenetic field. These planets did not birth into existence in the usual accretion fashion for they carried with them the organizational imprint of part of Tara's planetary grid morphogenetic field. These planets did not birth into Harmonic Universe 1. They fell into it, literally. Their original morphogenetic field fell in vibration, reorganized through the morphogenetic field of a star, and re-manifested within a slower, 
vibrating dimensional scale. The 12 new planets entering Harmonic Universe 1 55 million years ago are the planets of your local solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Maldek, which was imploded to become the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Nibiru, a very long orbit, yet not yet discovered by Earth scientists and your sun. The part of Tara's morphogenetic field that fused this already existing non-Terran sun. The fragments of Tara became part of the unified field morphogenetic structure of Harmonic Universe 1. So I want to take one pause there because if any of you have studied a lot of the Gnosis, the Gnosis of Sophia, the Gnosis of the creation of the universe from a lot of uh, the ancient texts upon the earth, you're going to see the, the Battle of Tiamat is one of those stories and how Tiamat was destroyed and how her body parts became this creation. And then even if you look at Greek mythology and the stories of how the planets were formed and their deity aspects to them, you're going to start to get to see the gaseous energy and how they started to reform and how they gave birth to each other. So this is where you can really start to now look at some of the gnosis that is on the planet and tie it in, but recognize how far down the historical chain is this, right? That is kind of more our more recent history of the development of the solar system that we're existing in right now. And now we're going to look at a lot of the lost souls that think about this, this implosion and this massive destruction that, kept, that happened to the morphogenetic field in Harmonic Universe 2 and the Pleiades created such a massive ripple effect within the cosmos. This is very much an astronomy type of thing, an explosion of a planet or an implosion of a star kind of energy. And when that happened, the gravitational fields, the magnetic um, fields of, of these other systems and the, and the black hole is very astronomy based, right? You're getting to see just the natural physics of the universe in the major cosmic body of the mother just got whew, pulled in. And because the vibrational frequency couldn't attune to her sun or her stars in the second harmonic universe anymore, that creates a fall in frequency or another way of saying that is a fall in consciousness. And so as all the particles got pulled through, that black hole, it's kind of showing us that through black holes, you end up in other dimensions, you end up in other places. And it fell in, and because it fell in, it had to start to acclimate to the energy and the physics of the new dimension that it fell into. And so the physics in the first harmonic universe are very dense, are very slow, right? And now we're going to recognize that there were fragmented souls, that there were beings that got ex like killed in this timeline. Many souls lost their life during the Elanian and, and Lumian uh, wars and the implosion of Tara. Not everybody made it to safety. Not everybody got evacuated. Not everybody made it into the inner earth. Some died in that implosion and many of those became lost souls. So let's dive into that part now. Because this is for all my soul family that's here to help bring the lost souls home. I got you. You're my family. All of you are my family. We got this. <laughs> the fall of man and the lost souls of millennium. So as we continue in this timeline, the event of Taro's cataclysm became known as the fall of man. This history became interwoven with other events on earth that, that occurred since that time, appearing in various forms throughout human mythology. The Adam and Eve drama of biblical stories combine this event as the fall from God's grace and removal from the Garden of Eden. With other earthly events, including the Dracon infiltration of around one million years ago, the stories became a depiction of multi-level events from various time periods, woven together into a symbolic period event portrayed in the stories. This is also done in relation to the biblical flood and Noah. The consciousness of the beings who were blown apart in Tara's fall also fell into Harmonic One. 
they became ripped from their race morphogenetic field at Tara's core and disengaged from their original soul matrices through which they needed to evolve in order to pass out of the time matrix and dimensionalized systems and return to source as pure consciousness. The souls of Elania became trapped in time, fragmented as units of consciousness within the unified field of Harmonic Universe 1, and there they would have to remain if a rescue mission had not been orchestrated. Ooh, I get goosebumps on that. The Amenti Rescue Mission. So now we're going to really dive into the Amenti Sphere, the Palidorian family, the Covenant of Palador and the Palidorians of Para. Just prior to the Cataclysm on Tara, 550 million years ago, the Ceres, Ur, Terranites, and Lumians of Mu, they devised a plan to rescue the Taran souls that would be lost in Harmonic Universe 1 during the approaching disaster. I just want to pause. I want you guys to recognize the rescue plan is really a time warp. It is kind of a time travel thing. There is an awareness of future events that were going to take place. And there is actually the creation of the angelic human race line, as we're going to see, was actually created. It was almost as though a time jump created, but time jumps are actually through the dimension. <laughs> and as we recognize this, the plan was actually put in place long before even the races were starting to create the distortions that were going to create the destruction for the rescue plan. How amazing is that? So just prior to the cataclysm, the Serez, the ur Terranites, and Lumians of Mu devised a plan to rescue the Terrian souls that would be lost in Harmonic Universe 1 during the approaching disaster. Being skilled at time portal mechanics and interdimensional portal travel, the Serez created a plan that the ur Terranites would fulfill. With the assistance of the Syrian Council, the Elohim, and the Harmonic Universe II Pleiadians, the ur Terranites formed an agreement with several other Harmonic Universe II races called the Covenant of Palador. Through the Covenant of Palador, a rescue mission for the Terran souls of Harmonic Universe I was set in motion. Those involved in this agreement which were the Syrians, the Pleiadians, the ur Terranites, the Elohims, the Lyrans, the Ceres, the Lumians, and the Elanians, okay? Huge group of different soul fields were coming together for this purpose. And they together became known as the Paladorians. Working through the Brenau Rishi, beings of pure consciousness from Harmonic Universe 5, we would see this as our creative creator source, seeds and beings. So working through the Brenau Rishi, the beings from Harmonic Universe 5, the Paladorians petition further assistance from an entity gestalt within the metagalactic core. And this entity is known as Ra or the Ra Confederacy. Now I want to take one pause because there is a, the word Ra that is used a lot in Egyptian uh, timelines. And it's really important to understand to use your discernment because the word raw has been hijacked and misused. Remember, the, the negative Syrian Anunnaki race lines, they take the true teachings and then they hijack them, change the codes, and then call themselves these things and use them for themselves. So what we are looking at is we are looking at the raw confederacy of beings, a race line from the metagalactic core. We're talking from completely other 15 dimensional time matrices way beyond these levels of consciousness. And that it was beings from Harmonic Universe 5 that really had to assist this petition to these metagalactic core beings in order to petition them, okay? So now we're really starting to understand, boy, does it go on and on and on, right? So here we are, and who are we connected to? Who reached out to actually help us? So working with the Brunel Rishis, beings of pure consciousness from Harmonic Universe 5, the Paladorians petitioned further assistance from an entity gestalt within the metagalactic core known as Ra or the Ra Confederacy. 
So of the 12 primary entity gestalts within the Raw Confederacy members, of its four largest gestalts, they became involved and allowed for the rescue mission to take place. So there was really the, the Raw Confederacy is actually not just a single entity or being, but it also has 12 primary entity gestalts within it. So five mass levels. This is how big this entity consciousness is. And of them, four of the 12 became involved for the rescue mission to take place. The four primary members of the Raw Confederacy involved within the Covenant of Palador are the Azurites, the Atone, the Ammonites, and the Brigidettes. A, group, a subgroup of the Brigidette are presently incarnating in your Earth system as members of the Ascended Masters family of Viragi. Several other groups associated with these three gestalts are also involved with Earth at this time, including the consciousness gestalt of Azar Azara and the Harmonic Universe 2 ET race known as the Zar Confederacy. Time travel and the sphere of Amenti. Using interdimensional portal mechanics, the ur terranites of the Covenant of Palador time travel into Harmonic Universe 1 to a space-time coordinate position just after the Cataclysm of Tara and the Fall of Man. Once on Earth, with the help of the Syrian Council, this group of ur terranites transmuted their body forms into pure energy, pure chelontic science, and merged into a gestalt energy field of consciousness, which served as a morphogenetic field or the 12 DNA strand Terranusium race prototype. Also contained within this morphogenetic field were the chelontic time codes, which are electrotonal frequency patterns of the pre-cataclysmic time-space coordinates of Tara, which would allow Tara to reassemble the lost portions of its grid into the fabric of time. With the assistance of the raw confederacy, this gestalt of conscious genetic and planetary morphogenetic field was entered into the remaining morphogenetic field of Earth through the 11th and the 14th dimensions. This morphogenetic field of consciousness energetically took on the shape of a sphere and was called the sphere of Amenti, named after the portion of Tara's morphogenetic field that contained the imprint for Mu and its inhabitants. Amenti was the part of Tara's planetary core that connected energetically to the portals upon the continent of Mu. So again, this is the motherland of Mu energy coming back. And the one thing I want to just break down for you, because it's a lot of big words. But basically what this is saying is that these race lines, all of these advanced interdimensional race lines, they actually entered into this field, changed their form, and they literally all together merged together into a sphere of energy. And that is the hall of Amenti. This sphere, this blue plasma sphere of light is not a thing. It's not a portal. It is a literal blending of race lines. What I want to offer you guys is to, to have a recognition that this is entire race lines of beings that sacrifice themselves to become a portal. Ah, oh, makes me teary-eyed. They sacrificed themselves, transmuted themselves, gave of themselves as a purpose to become the literal portal to share the genetic codes so that the rehabilitation could take place. The sphere of Amenti is a race line of beings. It is the Paladorians. So by placing the sphere of Amenti within the Earth's core, a wormhole or a portal link was established between Earth's core in Dimension 2 and Tara's core in Dimension 5. Through numerous other portals between Earth and Tara, though, sorry, let me read that again. Though numerous other portals between Earth and Tara existed, these had become unstable and their operations unpredictable following the fall. The sphere of Amenti would create a stable portal structure that, once operational, would stabilize other portals and allow open transit between Earth and Tara for beings possessing genetic codes that could endure the portal transit. 
The sphere of Aminti would link into space time of Tara's pre fall past. With this fear placed within the Earth as Earth re-evolved through the dimensional ascension back into the Taran grid following the morphogenetic imprint of the sphere, a link between the future Tara and its pre-cataclysmic past would be re-established. Tara's past would be reattached to the time matrix grid and Tara's future time cycles. Through the sphere of Amenti, a bridge was constructed between Tara's pre-cataclysmic past and future track cycles of time. When a planet undergoes such a trauma, having a portion of its grid blown apart, not only does it lose the portions of its evolutionary history stored within the cellular memories of the parts that blew apart, it also loses a portion of its energetic thrust. Without this thrust, the planet cannot evolve out of the harmonic universe and into the next. The planet and most life forms on it become trapped in the fabric of time. The sphere of Amenti not only gave hope for the continued evolution of the human Terranusium lineage, it held the hopes of ascension and continued evolution of Earth, Tara and her seventh dimensional counterpart Gaia. It was, if, if one was trapped in time, they would all be trapped. The only other option available in such cases of planetary morphogenetic field fragmentation is that of a host matrix transplant, as previously discussed in relation to people. And this is exceedingly difficult to uh, achieve on a planetary level. Each of the 12 planets in Harmonic Universe 1 that emerged as a result of Taurus fragmentation received a similar morphogenetic sphere from the Paladorians to fulfill the same purpose. But here we are only concerned with the sphere of Amenti, as though as through it, Earth became an ascension planet, able to achieve, achieve dimensional ascension and re-evolution. So I'm going to take a pause there for just a moment. As I just get to take a breath, just want to tap on here with so much love. Uh, thank you. It's so good to see you, Kevin, and who uh, to get through the density. Oh, perfect. I'm so glad this is helping. And so grateful to be reading this. Uh, this. This means so much to me because there's such important information in here, but I think sometimes it's just challenging to get through some of the codes <laughs> within it. And so within this, I want to kind of touch into what they're saying is that basically because of the fall of Earth, the entire planetary um, repatterning or recorrecting the host matrix transplant is really difficult to do on a planetary level because there's so many different moving parts within it. But within these moving parts, we're going to recognize that that's where the smaller moving parts come in. This is where the, the, uh, the sphere of Amenti was really, really, really important. But also what we're going to start to recognize is the seeded races, the seeded races that we're going to start to be incarnating onto the earth plane. We're going to be what are infusing those very energies to help accelerate. It mentioned in there how when we lose the frequency, we can't move as fast. The light cannot move as fast as it needs to in the lower dimensions. So we're all these little star sparkles that come in here to get the engine moving quicker. You can kind of think of it as that. So it's really important for us to understand that as individuals, our sole purpose really does start to look kind of small. I don't, I don't want to degrade it in any way, but let's look at it from a greater picture. So each of us individually might feel like, what is our sole purpose? What difference will it make? But look at all of us together as a whole. We are really truly here to help Earth with this Ascension Planet project and the re-evolution. So let's go more into this Soul Ascension Rescue Plan. Let me just, ah, here we go. Perfect. Just want to kind of see. Uh, we're just going to go through a couple more pages of this today and then dive in at another time as we keep going. 
the sphere of Amenti and Soul Ascension Rescue Mission from Tara. So now we're looking at a much larger sound. We're going to be looking at about 250 million years of time here. So the sphere of Amenti was entered into Earth's core within a second dimensional frequency band called the Cave of Creation. About 550 million years ago, from a position in Harmonic Universe 2, space-time that existed before the Earth existed within the Harmonic Universe 2 time track. This rescue mission for Tara's lost souls was begun before the souls even became lost in terms of linear time. Such things are quite practical within the structure of the time matrix. Through the covenant of Palador and the sphere of Amenti, the souls of Earth could re-evolve back to their original 12-strand DNA body type. This process can be viewed as the Paladorians creating new bodies and morphogenetic blueprints for the now formless consciousness fragments of the fallen souls. The sphere of Amenti morphogenetic field allowed for the ur Terranites to enter incarnational cycles on Earth pick up the fragments of consciousness from the lost souls by pulling their energetic particles from the harmonic universe unified fields into the DNA, merging the consciousness of the soul fragments within the embodied Ur Terranite consciousness, therefore allowing this composite identity to evolve through a sentient life form back into its original soul matrix, which is the Terranusium 12 strand prototype. This evolutionary plan was not immediately set into motion through the sphere of Amenti was set, though the sphere of Amenti was set within Earth's morphogenetic field nearly 550 million years ago, the Earth grid had to evolve and pick up grid speed before the sphere of Amenti could begin birthing in its new races. So between 250 and 550 million years ago, various other species seeded by Harmonic Universe 1 ET visitors evolved on Earth, some of whom became members of your planet, your animal kingdom, your insect kingdom. Various groups of other etheric beings without matter density also spent time on this planet. The races of the sphere of Amenti finally began to appear on Earth about 250 million years ago. Before their appearance, more intergalactic wars were fought by races who did not want the Covenant of Palador to be fulfilled. These wars were primarily fought on Tara, becoming a part of a long history of confrontations that were simply termed the Taran Wars. Once the Earth territory was secured, the ur terranites of the Sphere of Amenti began birthing on Earth. This began what became known as the Terranusium II, or the T2 experiment. This represented the seeding of the 12 tribes out of which your present human lineage has emerged. The Halls of Amenti, the cloistered races of parallel Earth and the second world, rescue mission stage one. From the sphere of Amenti, five smaller spheres were created, which became the morphogenetic patterns for five races known as the cloistered races. Collectively, the cloistered races were called the Paladorians, as they represented the beginning of the fulfillment of the covenant of Palador. They represented the earthly counterparts to the Paladorian group from Harmonic Universe 2. Of the original Terranusium 1, 12-strand DNA package, each Paladorian race held the morphogenetic imprint for the DNA strands of dimensions 7 to 12 which held the electrotonal frequencies corresponding to dimensions 7 through 12, plus the imprint for strand 1, and each of the five groups carried the imprint for one additional DNA strand corresponding to dimensions 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So that's going to be all 1 through 12 within there, but we're seeing that each one came in holding a very specific strand. None of them had all of them. The cloisters served as guardians for the evolution of the additional DNA strand to which they were assigned. 
each race had eight strands of DNA manifest within the body structure. The five cloistered races did not possess gender, nor did they originally possess the degree of matter density with which you are familiar. Density of form developed over time throughout the course of their evolution on Earth. And between 250 million years and 25 million years ago, the five cloistered races were, one, the Erantrians, which were the brown-skinned strand to number two, the Branoa red skin strand number three, the Hibiru white skin strand number four, the Melchizedek, which were the yellow skin strand number five, and then the Uniseti, the black skin strand number six. Now, I want to take a pause for a minute because it's saying that everyone came in with eight strands of DNA, which means they had the strands of seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 within, but then they only held another strand within there, another strand or two within there, not the complete code. So all of them together held another piece of the puzzle. This is really important to understand that no race came in with all the information or all the codes there. So this is where when you start to connect to different ancient histories on the earth and these different ancient race lines, you want to kind of recognize they all held one piece of the puzzle, but there is no origin point because the origin point is truly off planetary. The cloistered races populated the earth for many generations, creating various racial mixtures through which many of the lost souls of Tara were able to ascend. This period of great civilization became known as the Second World, which was 250 to 25 million years ago. Within our present Native American cultures, many of these souls ascended. Those who digressed returned to the sphere of Amenti to rebirth on Earth in the particle universe as members of the root races. The first world represented the original Terranusium cultures of Tara, which were 560 to 550 million years ago. The Paladorian cloister races left no remnants in your present world, for they evolved within the faster moving time bands of Earth, within the antiparticle universe. The morphogenetic fields of those races were then drawn into your particle Earth, and out of these came the next evolutionary stage. Now we're moving into the first seed and second etheric root races of Gaia. So some of these we're going to even see or is looking, we're going to start to see words like Polarian, Hyperborean. A lot of these are, are sometimes referred to within the ancient Greek mythologies, like these god or titan-like beings, the Olympians and titans and these kind of things. I want to kind of invite you to start to recognize um, where our mythologies are blending in with these galactic histories. Before manifestation into embodiment on your earth, the five cloistered races divided into two groups. One group held the DNA imprint for half of the first strand of the DNA, which corresponded to the dimension one frequencies. The other group held the remaining half of the first strand, which created polarization and gender within the cloistered race morphogenetic field. Both groups held the dimensional code strands of seven through 12, these two groups were seated on Gaia, the seventh dimensional or harmonic universe three counterpart to Tara and Earth. These two races were the first two root races, and they were the Polarians of Gaia and the Hyperboreans of Gaia's anti-particle double. So if you look at the 12 tree sphere of life within the Kelantic sciences, you're going to see that the Gaian template is held within the third harmonic universe. It is very much connected to the Orion, the Orion energy and the Orion uh, constellation or part of the body of mother. These beings were of a much less dense or etheric nature, but through their evolution on Gaia 25 million to 20 million years ago, so an evolution of 5 million years, the pathways of evolution through dimensional ascension were reopened for the lost souls of Tara. These races anchored the morphogenetic fields of dimensions 7 to 12 into the dimensions 1 and Earth. 
Through their evolution, the one strand of the 12 strand DNA package was pulled together in Earth's particles and connected to the Terranusium morphogenetic field. The Halls of Amenti, the rescue mission stage three. 25 million years ago, the morphogenetic consciousness of the five cloistered races held within the sphere of Amenti began the third stage of the seeding of humans on Earth 25 million years ago. They opened the sphere of Amenti within the Earth's core in dimension two, which opened a portal bridge to Tara's core in dimension five a portal that linked the Earth of 25 million years ago with pre-cataclysmic Tara of 550 million years ago. Pretty cool stargate, huh? Working with the priesthoods of Ur and Mu on Tara, the consciousness of the five cloistered races created five other portal bridge extensions from the center of the sphere of Amenti, each of the five openings into the dimensional fields two through six. Dimensional fields represent positions in space and time within our time matrix. Stages a planet or being will pass through in its evolutionary progression of dimensional ascension. The six portals from the sphere of Amenti, the original one to Tara's past and the five new ones into various stages of Earth's future linked to Tara's past through various time periods of Earth. In Tara's future, creating a new track in time through which Earth could re-evolve into the fifth dimensional frequency bands that merge with Tara. Once this merger was accomplished, Earth would become Tara. New lands would open up within and emerge upon the Earth, and Tara would reclaim the energetic thrust lost in the fall so evolution into the seventh dimensional Gaia could continue. The six portals in the spheres of Amente could al also allow the five cloistered races to incarnate into dimensional bands and time fields two through six, pulling in their consciousness and body forms, the fragmented consciousness of the lost souls from each of these dimensional bands. The time codes or fre frequency patterns from the first dimensional strand of DNA that had been built up through root races one and two would link into the frequencies of dimension two through six. And the consciousness within the sphere of Amenti would leave the morphogenetic field and express into manifestation as root races within each of those dimensional bands, building up the DNA pattern strands two through six. Through this pattern of building DNA through time, incarnates within each time period or dimensional band would also be able to pull together the frequencies of their dimensional strand through a series of 24 incarnations or two 12 cycles, link with the morphogenetic field of their cloistered race, pick up strands seven through 12 from the cloister, and then pass through the other cloisters and pick up the remaining root race strands, rebundling the 12 strand DNA package. As the DNA strands were assembled, the body form, the incarnate, form of the incarnate would progressively transmute into a less dense state and ascend into harmonic universe two on Tara. Originally only one earth body was needed for this process as the form would assemble the DNA patterns within the 12, the two 12 cycles in one very long lifetime and then transmute and ascend. Okay. That's a, that's a whole lot. I'm going to take a pause <laughs> for just a moment. Um, what I want to kind of say about this is that what was happening, the key thing I want to show right here is it was saying it was one lifetime. It was one, one massive cycle that was taking place in order for all of these different processes to take place. And this was originally how it was happening with the original root races. But for those of you that are indigos, those of you that are here as star seeds, as light beings on this rescue mission, you basically are the sphere of Amenti now because you have at this stage of progression already integrated all of these energies. And that's really in a nutshell what is being said here is it's about pulling in the lost energy, transmuting it through, and then constantly lightening the density of it, clearing it out, and then 
rising one's consciousness into these multidimensional spheres of consciousness. This is merging the consciousness of our avatars through all the way to dimension six, if we want to look at it this way. Now, this is what we are doing through soul retrieval, through healing our family karma, healing our family tree. We are pulling in the energy of all of the lost souls, all of these last fri fragments, moving them through our corridors, moving them through the sphere, if you will. And as they move through us and through our consciousness, through our body as a karma resolution or a, a bioregenesis vehicle, we become the transmutation for that energy so that it dissolves out all of the density and gets recoded again with the correct light language that it needs to keep passing through the dimensional stargates. That's a, it's, it's honestly, this writing is a little bit complicated in the way that it's basically mechanically talking about what is soul retrieval and what is clearing density and karma, if you will, in the body and restructuring ourselves with our divine blueprint so that we begin to drop the density and start to attune our sacred geometry to move through the stargates again. We're recognizing that something has tremendously gone wrong in the process because this used to be done through one life cycle, but now it takes us many incarnational cycles and very little memory and very little time to catch up to do it. But this, I feel, is very much changing for all of us. So I want to just um, continue on here. I hope that makes sense a little bit. The ascension occurred through the portal from the sphere of Amenti to which the incarnate's dimensional band time period was connected. Once passing through its dimensional portal into the sphere of Amenti, the incarnate could enter one of the other portal bridges and appear on Tara in a future space-time coordinate, becoming free from Harmonic Universe 1. Through this process, the consciousness of Tara's fragmented parts would be returned to Tara's planetary grid piece by piece, progressively de-densifying the matter particles of Earth and transmuting them back into Tara's grid. As the lost souls returned to Tara, so did the lost portions of Tara's morphogenetic field. Through the dynamics of this process, or sorry, let me restart that. Though the dynamics of this process are complicated, the principle is simple. The portals within the sphere of Amente serve as time portal structures through which the lost sub since an energetic thrust of Tara could be returned and the lost souls of Tara could return to their original identity as souls incarnated upon the planet Tara. In ancient Taran history, this planet had once, long ago, eons before the 560 million year ago Terranusium seeding, it had once been located within the first harmonic universe and had successfully evolved into the fifth dimension and second harmonic universe. The fall represented a portion of Tara being thrown back into its own past through which it had to re-evolve in order for the planet to evolve into its natural future. The portals within the sphere of Amenti operated as a warp in time through which re-evolution could take place more quickly. The human lineage is an intimate part of that re-evolutionary plan. And this plan is the underlining hidden dynamic and purpose for the present human evolution. This plan is part of a larger Taran Gaian evolutionary plan, which ultimately will lead all to all consciousness involved returning to its source. The sphere of Amenti contains the purposes and mechanics of humanity's evolutionary blueprint. The time portal structures within the sphere of Amenti regulate the processes of humanity's dimensional ascension and evolution or return to God. The portals within the morphogenetic field of the sphere of Amenti are also known as the halls of Amenti. They are the dimensional passageways one must pass through in order to ascend from Earth out of the time matrix and dimensionalized reality. The halls of Amenti have been closely guarded um, and a closely guarded secret since the time of your inception on earth and the priests of Ur and Mu and their earthly descendants and the ET and meta-terrestrial ancestors 
of your Terranusium lineage from the Harmonic Universes 2 through 5 have been the guardians of the secret since the time of its inception 550 million years ago. So with this, I want to go through one more of these sections and really allow each and every one of us to just hold this vibrational energy. Let me just kind of see where we are uh, within this. There's uh, just a few, few more pages, but I'm just going to read this last section and we're going to end on root races and cloister races. So I'm just going to read this one last section for today. How's everybody doing? It's a lot, isn't it? It brings back a lot of the memories, doesn't it? And it helps us understand so much more the passage of souls, the transition at the time at the end of life, how we are meant to move our consciousness, what we can attune to, what dimensional fields we can maybe start to align to. But this is truly our legacy of the soul is to know that we have the permission to utilize these stargates to not be trapped here in these incarnational cycles any longer. That's super important. So the staff of a menti blue flame morphogenetic field, the ivory gates of Tara, uh, 25 million years ago. Once the halls of a menti were created, 25 million years ago, the priests of Ur on Tara drew out from Tara's fifth dimensional core a pattern of frequency that represented the morphogenetic field for the entire planetary grid structure. They removed from Tara the morphogenetic field through which Tara drew its energy imprint for its grid line structure and matter form. By removing this form holding energy field from Tara's core, Tara, Tara could no longer build a bridge of frequency between its core and Gaia's core at the eighth dimensional metagalactic core. This removal of Tara's interior morphogenetic field was done out of necessity. If the morphogenetic field had remained within Tara's core, Tara's progression of dimensional ascension into the harmonic universe would have continued only up into a point. And when the planetary grid of Tara had pulled in the remaining frequency bands from the unified fields of dimensions five and six through the morphogenetic field at its core, it would next begin to pull in the frequencies of the seventh dimension and begin its ascent into the Gaian planetary grid structure. This is the natural path of evolution for a planet. However, if the seventh dimensional frequency bands entered and expanded Tara's morphogenetic field, certain portions of these frequencies could not plug into the grid lines of the planet as they needed to do so, because portions of these grid lines had been ripped apart during the fall event. I actually want to take one second with this because this is super important for us to recognize as our body. So there is sometimes um, timelines that we place ourselves on on our awakening journey, how fast the light codes and the energy, because this is saying that Tara would have continued her progression to connect to the Gaian timeline. But because there was distortion and this... Uh, portions of her grids in the lower vibrations that were fractured, therefore not able to sustain or hold the correct energy for this evolutionary path. Had that seventh dimensional band been allowed to integrate in, it would have been destructive. And we're going to see later on that this is also what happened to Earth, that our frequency net where we feel cut off from our star families, some of it um, has been used against us inappropriately, but it was actually created out of the necessity to make sure that the higher dimensional frequencies emanating into Earth didn't blow up the planet. So this, again, is part of why we are so important. We all came in as little raindrops, if you will, that little by little brought light, more light, more light, more light, more frequency to the earth so that little by little the earth could acclimate to these newer, higher rotating frequencies and then therefore could begin to handle more 
of the, the rehabilitation of its structure to handle higher light bands or photonic waves coming in. So what it's saying here is that because of this fall, they had to purposefully go in and basically shut down or take offline some of Tara's morphogenetic field lines, which is exactly what had to get done also to Earth, so that we had to go in like these little light beam electricians to rebuild the whole light grid all over again so that we would not actually blow up our planets because we were so excited to get all the higher frequencies of the evolution back into light. So it's really about an evolutionary maturity that we had to take this slow path for some of this work, okay? The energy carrying the frequencies of D7 that could not pass into the framework of Earth's energetic structure would build up within the morphogenetic field of Tara's core, eventually causing the entire grid system and the planet to explode. The morphogenetic field of Tara had to be temporarily removed from the planet's core, which would leave Tara with the ability to draw energy from its grid from the unified fields of dimensions four through six, but would not allow any higher frequency energies to enter into its grid system. This meant that Tara would be trapped in the time bands of Harmonic Universe 2, unable to evolve out of those frequencies until its morphogenetic field had been returned to the planetary core. This planet had to remain connected to its morphogenetic field in order re to retain its form, but the field could not be stored within the planet's structure. This helps us understand a little bit, just a side note, this helps us understand just a little bit, why are the Pleiadians helping? <laughs> Why are some of these off-planetary races happen, helping? Why are some of the beings from fourth, fifth, sixth dimensional realms helping? Why are the beings even from seventh, eighth, and ninth dimensional bands helping? Because until all of the lost fragments of Para are brought back home, all of these dimensions in some way are stuck in their time bands of time. And they can't progress until the parts are brought back. So I wanna say this in just one lateral way really quick. And that is, this is the same as when we do family constellations work or where we are restoring the family tree. When our family members are out of place or out of time, it disrupts or destroys a family tree. It keeps it stuck in limiting patterns. And so part of what we're doing is we're getting all of the particles back to their appropriate time bands. <laughs> in order to help restructure all of these, um, these grids, these morphogenetic fields so that they can come back online again. And this is, this is really, really special to understand that we might feel stuck in time, but there's actually beings in second harmonic universe that feel stuck in time, third harmonic universe that feels stuck in time. And so that is partially why we have interdimensional and off planetary races that do help what is happening here. The morphogenetic field of Tara had to be placed within the portions of the original morphogenetic field that had been blown apart, broken down among the 12 harmonic one planets. So each of our 12 planets within the solar system would hold a portion of Tara's morphogenetic field. And Tara would draw, could draw in sustaining energy from each of these areas. Meanwhile, other planets would um, process the dimensional frequency patterns that Tara could not synthesize. Once a harmonic one planet pulled in its portions of the higher dimensional frequencies, it could then undergo dimensional ascension back into Tara's grid, bringing with it its portions of the Taran morphogenetic field. Tara could not ascend to harmonic universe three and become Gaia until each of its harmonic universe one planets completed the manifestation of their portion of the morphogenetic field and ascended back into the Taran grid. This, the time when this will occur is many millions of years in your future, but each planet in your solar system has its parts to play in the program. I'm just gonna let you guys just ingest that thought for just a minute. Whew. Yeah, I know a lot of us are like, I want it now. Why aren't we in the new earth now? Why aren't we fixing it now? But 
you know, we got to understand this is very galactic. This is planetary evolution, solar system evolution that is taking place. And it's very, very needed, very important. Each planet received its portion of the Taran morphogenetic field. Earth received its portion 25 million years ago when the halls of Amenti were constructed. The five cloistered races of the sphere of Amenti retrieved their frequency pattern 25 million years ago. This pattern of energy, morphogenetic field, had the appearance of a standing wave pattern composed of fourth and fifth dimensional frequencies and thus appearing as blue in color. There's our blue. Visually, the standing wave pattern looks like an electric blue flame with a pale shade of green several inches in height. The blue flame, which constitutes Earth portion of Tara's morphogenetic field, was brought into the sphere of Amenti by the cloistered five cloistered races and the priesthood of Ur and Mu. The fifth dimensional frequency patterns held in the blue flame allowed for the halls of Amenti to open up so the seeding and evolution of the five remaining root races could begin on Earth. The flame was stored within the sphere of Amenti, and as long as it was there, the portals between Earth's dimensional time periods and Tara could remain open. The souls of Earth could ascend out of the Harmonic Universe One incarnational cycles and continue their evolution through Tara. The blue flame became known as the Staff of Amenti, which is the item referred to in your Bible as the Staff of God, of the rod and the staff. The rod represents the standing wave pattern within Earth's core in dimension two, orange, gold in color, and composed of the frequency patterns of dimensions one, two, and three. The blue flame Staff of Amenti was composed of the frequency patterns of dimensions four, five and six, and allowed Tara's morphogenetic field to link with the double flame at Gaia's core, the violet and pale gold flames that would allow Gaia to link with the winged gold flame of the metagalactic core. When we speak of the colored flames, we are referring to multiple bands of frequencies of which morphogenetic fields are composed. Colors represent spectras of light, and light represents the manifestation of patterns and dimensionalized electrotonal frequency. Through linking the frequency bands of dimensions one through seven within the morphogenetic field, a planet or a person can now ascend and evolve out of the matter-based systems and into pure sentient consciousness. This is the evolutionary process. So the blue flame staff of Amenti stored within the time warp morphogenetic field of the sphere of Amenti represents the key to the evolution of Earth and the human lineage and one of the keys to the evolution of the planets in your solar system, Tara and Gaia. The staff of Amenti is the gateway into Tara's morphogenetic field. Whether the staff is held within Tara's core or within the sphere of Amenti at Earth's core, it represents the gateway to which the halls of Amenti lead. One can pass into the halls of Amenti, but must pass through the blue flame in order to transmute form and appear on Tara. In later Egyptian mystery schools, the blue flame gateway became known as the gates of ivory, which became translated in biblical terms as the pearly gates of heaven. In each case, these writings refer to the blue flame staff of Amente, the energetic gateway to Tara. Needless to say, the sphere of Amente and the staff, which allows the halls of Amente to open into Tara, are quite valuable commodities. Every human on Earth now is in some way energetically connected to the race morphogenetic field within the sphere of Amente. And it is through the halls of Amente or through the Taran morphogenetic sphere within one of the other 11 planets of your solar system that you must ascend to fulfill your evolutionary imprint as souls and return to your creator, creative source. Whew. I'm gonna take a pause there. We will continue our next time together, starting with the root races and the cloistered races, which is actually on page 15. <sighs> 
I'm just going to take a moment to peek at, at some of the chat here. This has been amazing to get to share this with you guys. Thank you so much. How many of you guys feel a lot of these memories in your genetics? Like for me, this is something that I many times I tear up. I feel it. I feel it with such a passion. And that's part of how we get our, our memories back is that when they come back online, we feel it. It might be goosebumps. It might be tears. It might be these feelings that are coming up for us. So within that, I invite you guys to take this wisdom. We're going to continue through this entire journey together. And I just want to share so much love, so much gratitude. I want to just give one last um, energetic uh, thought for you guys to contemplate. And that is that energy of the blue flame or the blue light or blue ray family. It is a frequency band of consciousness. And this is something that I feel that has been really increasing upon the planet. I feel a lot more people are connecting to these beings, recognizing these beings, starting to have visitation from these beings. This is really showing us this advancement of the realignment of our gateways and our doorways back home to source. So with so, so much love, I just want to say thank you so much, you guys. Just one more shout out to everybody. So much love. I love you, Danielle. Oh, uh, slid down on my thing here. Danielle, Lavender Sky Panther. So happy to have you here. Shannon, love you. I'm giving you big, huge hugs. Shelly, so much love. Goddess energy, energy. Love to you, Robin. Oh, love you, love you. Kevin, Stephanie, Darlene. Thank you guys, Sunny. Thank you guys, Stellar Shriner. And everyone who has joined in or who will watch this in the future, uh, let's keep going. The, the, our, our wisdom is coming back.